How's it going everyone? David Hoffman here with Behind the Catch Fence and welcome to episode 57. We're nearing 60 here pretty quickly so that's super exciting and we're looking forward to it. But for now episode 57 is upon us and we got sprint car driver Lance DeWeese on the show. Lance was inducted into the National Sprint Car Hall of Fame in 2018 and he's been a staple in the Pennsylvania region for decades now. And among his many accomplishments, he has five Williams Grove Speedway National Open wins, and he holds the record for most sprint car wins at that track, 114 as of this recording. Now on the show today, he and I discuss how he got started in sprint car racing, to some of the famed cars he's had the opportunity to race in, his keys to success at Williams Grove, the High Limit versus World of Outlaws debate, and much more. So with that... Sit back, relax, grab your favorite snack, maybe some chips and queso for a little bit of spice in your life today, and enjoy this episode with Lance DeWeese. Kind of going into it a little bit, just where did your love for racing begin with? Where did it kind of originate from? Well, I actually, I grew up around racing when I was a very young age, like one, two years old, three years old. I grew up playing at Hagerstown Speedway in the grandstands. Um, back then, my father and his brothers owned what were called late malls back then. Um, and that's kind of, I grew up in it. Then we got out, then they got out of it. And then once I turned 16, we kind of, me and my father were out riding around one day and kind of seen a micro. And that's kind of how it all started. And at what point, just as you're kind of going through that process, watching it and did you really start to feel like you could, you know, maybe hop into one of those cars and make a career out of it? Well, I really never. I mean, they got out of it while I was still pretty young. Um, so once I started racing micros, um, we just wanted to move out of the micros. And back then there was only two classes for us locally to race in. And that would have been super sportsmen or sprint cars. So, um, the sprint car route was a little easier than the super sportsman route. They used to get 80 cars a night at Silver Spring Speedway. So um, we went the sprint car route and just we were just racing. That's all we were doing. Really didn't think about nothing else. Did you really or I guess did you feel that or was there anyone in particular that kind of helped you as you're sort of in that younger stage of kind of developing as a driver? Or did you kind of have to learn on your own in a way? I kind of had to learn on my, my as I went. Um Wolfgang was driving for a Weikert car um, at that time when I started, and they helped me out a lot as far as with used parts and keeping me racing that way. Um, and I always looked up to him, so um, I kind of think our driving styles are a lot alike compared to you know anybody else. So um, I've always had a lot of respect, but I have a lot of respect for all everybody that's ever strapped themselves in one. As you kind of got into a rhythm with you know racing weekly and everything else, just when did you really? feel you know that point of where you kind of had your career kickstart was it with the you know the dire number four 461 or was it like before that where you really started to kind of get into a rhythm of things well i mean we were fortunate enough i've won um basically other than my very first year i've won a race every year since i've been racing and we did that with doing a very limited schedule with our own stuff so um when walter dyer marsha dyer gave me the shot to drop 461 that's what kind of boosting my career to, you know, get it started in the, the right direction for it be successful like I have been. Obviously, you know, it's probably one of the more iconic rides in all sprint car racing. Just, yeah. you know, you, that pretty much was your first like, big time role. You guys won 132 races or something over seven and a half years. Just, I mean, what was it with that duo that sort of made everything click? It's just a bunch of hardworking people. Um, yeah, you know, we didn't have no full time help or anything like that. We just, you know, everybody worked hard at it. Um, you know, he gave us the stuff to be successful at it, and you know, it was a building process. When I got there, it was, you know, you we built it into what it was. You know, over time, we, you know, he, when I got there, he had two motors. You know, by the time I left there, he had um four or five. So, you know, we just you just build it, you know, you just take your time and build it and try to do things right. And, you know, we were fortunate enough to, you know, have um, a good bit of success on the way. Were you mainly based in Pennsylvania at the time, or did you guys travel out a lot during that? Yeah, well, we always went to Florida every year to start the year. Um, we would go to Knoxville in some years, um, but mainly we raced mainly Pennsylvania. Okay. 
And obviously, you know, you can't talk about PA without, you know, Williams Grove. And just obviously that track has been one of, you know, one of your top tracks. Just, you know, you hold the all time wins record in sprint cars. Just, I guess looking at Williams Grove a little bit, just, I mean, regardless of the car, the, the time period, the competition that you guys faced uh, just over the years, just I mean, what seems to always click for you there at, at the Grove? It's just a very tricky racetrack. Um, it's, you know, it's very hard to show up and go fast your very first time there, especially when it gets slick. Um, it's just, it's just a very tough racetrack. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's a bull ring with big, long straightways. So it's, it's just, the car feels totally different. Um, it needs to do different things than what it does at most other racetracks to make it go real fast there. And you have to learn how to drive the place correctly. And, um, it just from day one, I've always just kind of, you know, fit my driving style. And, you know, we've always been pretty decent there anytime I've been there. So it's just, you know, it just kind of worked out that, you know, it's one of the places that I'm, I'm pretty good at. And it always seems like I, I when I've talked to other drivers about the Grove specifically, it always seems like it's one of those tracks that you either love it or you hate it. There's really no kind of in between with it. Just, I do feel it's just, because of the the boring style in the quarters and then the long straightaways that kind of makes it as you know it's kind of you know feast or famine for some guys or yeah you know, what do you feel is the reason why some guys may not like that well it's, it's a very hard racetrack and i think you know until you you know learn how to run the place and it's one of those racetracks that you tend to have to slow up to go fast um and a lot of guys don't like doing that um but once you kind of learn how to run it you know you know, David Gravel, who kind of started racing at Rims Grove, has become very good there, you know, with the Outlaws. Um, Donnie Schatz, who's always been really good there. But, you know, just like them guys, they've also had their struggles when they first came there. So it, you just have to adapt and learn. And, you know, it's just a place that you're not going to show up and go real fast at. And, you know, talking about a little bit earlier, obviously running Walter Dyer's car for a number of years. Just, I mean, you've had that unique opportunity of running his car, Al Hamilton's 77 car, Hefner's 27, you know, 69K with Kreitz. Just, I mean, they're all synonymous in sprint car racing. Just, I mean, to race so many of those legendary cars and race for those owners over the years, just how, how has that kind of helped you just along the way, helped you grow just not only – inside the race car competing with, with those team owners, but also just grow as a person during that time as well. Well, it all does. You know, when I started driving for Walter Dyer, I was kind of young in the sport, not young by today's standard, but kind of young. And, um, you know, we just keep building our careers, you know, you know, some of the, you know, some of the most things I'm proud of are the teams that nobody thought I could win with and we would go win with you know, and win outlaw shows with. So, um, I've always enjoyed doing that. You know, you just named all the popular teams that everybody knows of, but the other teams like the 14 of the Dietz car, um, 25 Pete post packs car, um, teams that, you know, nobody really knew much about until I hopped in them and, and, you know, to be successful with them, you know, it makes me proud of what I could do for them. And just, you know, kind of going along, obviously, a couple of years ago, 2018, you were inducted into the National Sprint Car Hall of Fame, which is a huge deal. Uh, just, I mean, what still sticks out to you, I guess, specifically with that day and that induction that kind of still you hold close to your heart today? Well, it, it was kind of weird because it, I really didn't think much of it, to tell you the truth, until I got there. And when I got there, and it was just when you sit there and listen to talk to about all the inductees. You know, not not myself personally, but all the other inductees and what they accomplished. You know, it, it's just a great honor. And, um, you know, and I raced against some of the people that were inductee, inductees. So, I mean, um, as a mechanic or whatever. So it, it was just a great honor. Um, you know, it just it was a pleasure to have so much support go out. I think there was like 20 some people that went out to support me. So it was, you know, that just you know, shows the type of support I've had through my career with the owners and people that involved and backing me. So it was just a great day and I um, really enjoyed it a lot. And kind of obviously Knoxville's right there on the doorstep uh, of the Hall of Fame. Just it's, you know, just be having run the Knoxville Nationals over the years. Just 
I, it has that certain prestige that maybe, you know, it's on the level of a Daytona or an Indianapolis type of field. Just from your perspective, what makes you know, the Knoxville Nationals such a unique event that that's different from any other form of motorsport, any other event? Well, it, it's sprint car wise, it is our Daytona 500 or our Indy 500. Um, it's a very tough format, very hard format. And Knoxville is kind of like Williams Grove. It's a very hard track to learn to get around right. Um, it's, you know, when it starts getting slick and doing the things it does, um, you can see guys that who have a lot of laps there, how good they are. Um, and that's why if you really look at the history of Knoxville Nationals, there's not been a whole lot of different winners. You know, the guys that show up, they know what they're doing there. Um, I remember the one year, um, I think it was when we were on good years, um, Donnie Schatz was having a terrible year. I think every time they came in the Grove, he had to use provisionals for the shows. But when he showed up in Knoxville, he was the best car there. You know I mean, it's just, it's just, it's just one of those places that once you figure it out, you kind of have it figured out. And um, you know, the locals run really good there. Um, you know, Danny and Brian Brown, um, Daniel Lasowski and Brian Brown's always gone really fast there, but they grew up racing there. So, you know. It's just it's just one of those things, and shots kind of grew up racing there some too. So, um, it's just it's just it's a very tough racetrack because you have to be able to run the bottom there, and it's really tricky with berm and um and to run it right and make a lot of speed. And um, me personally, there's not too many people who do it better than Donnie Shots. You guys obviously competed over the years, and he's won his fair share of national opens uh, at Williams Grove as well. Just I mean, you've won five of them yourself over the years, second all time. You passed Steve Kinzer uh, last time, 2022. Just, I mean, what makes the National Open to you such a prestigious race? Obviously, we talked about Knoxville, but what what kind of, with Williams Grove just in itself, how does that compare to another race or, you know, what well, makes that been, event so interesting and special? It's been around a long time, just like Knoxville Nationals. Um, you know, if you look at the win list, of the Williams Grove National, it has IndyCar stars, NASCAR stars, you know, that have won it. So um, it means a lot to me as locally to be able to win our biggest race around and to be able to do it five times is special. What's more special to me, be able to do it four times with um, different owners. Um, so, yeah, it's just one of those tracks and one of those races that we try to gear up for every year and, you know, that's kind of what we worry about is <clears throat> getting right for the Grove National when it shows up. And that ended up being uh, 2022, your 20th outlaw win there, which tied with Greg Codnett. Uh, I know that you could tell that meant a lot to you when we were on uh, Victory Lane watching you celebrate and everything. Just how would you describe just that relationship that you and Greg had just over the years and just the enjoyment of competing with him? Well, we we always had a very cordial and um, relationship you know, you could beat and bang off each other the night before, and next night you'd be talking about, you know, something outside of racing, and you, you don't, you know, nobody was doing anything intentionally. It's just part of racing, but, you know, he was one of the few guys that we could go, me and him could go to each other and talk and talk about stuff outside of racing. And, um, you know, we were close on age, which, you know, kind of at that time was one of the few people around my age still racing. So, um you know, it meant a lot. You know, he was a transplant from Tennessee to Pennsylvania and, you know, built a really great career in, in PA racing. And the last couple of questions, you joined uh, Shearer, the Shearer family at the end of last year to start driving their number 12 car. This, why do you feel driving for them in this moment right now is the right fit for you? Well, it just, it takes me back to a little bit of where I'm a little bit more hands-on, a little bit more involved. Um, just good people, good hardworking people that want to race. They want to race the type of schedule I like racing. And there might be some opportunities down the road for my son to do a little bit of testing with the sprint car too. So, and um, Barry's son and my son have become friends, you know, before I started driving for him. So um, it, it just, it kind of just seemed like a match that would work. And, you know, that's kind of, I think a lot of people were shocked. I took that deal maybe over some other deals, but it just seemed like the right thing to do to me. You mentioned your son Cole to stop as he's getting his career kick started on uh, dirt racing. Just 
I mean, how fun has it been for you just to be able to see him in this element as well and just being able to help guide him in a way as well? Um, it, it's, it's really fun. A lot more funner than I thought I would enjoy it. Um, the thing that shocks me the most is about how, how smart he is at racing already for never racing up until we started. He's going on his third year. Um, he never raced nothing in his life until that point that we started. So he, he's just learned a lot and, and he's very, um, learns the mechanical end of it very well. So um, he realistically don't need me other than right now, me take their trailer and car to the track. He can handle it all from there. Um, it was neat on Sunday at Williams Grosvenor. He, he was, you know, by my side when um, doing setups, um, talking to me about different things. And yeah, that's the part that really, you know, enticed me because that's kind of what I'd done my whole career. So it, it, for him to learn it and learn it quickly at a young age, is really impressive to me in a way does it kind of make you feel a little bit younger being able to kind of re, re just rejuvenate you a little bit kind of being able to see his youthfulness and see him kind of learning and getting excited about it no it's got me worn out i mean he <laughs> he has the his schedule has 130 some shows on it um oh, so you add in my 50 to 60 it's a busy year um i'm very fortunate to have a, a family friend that used to race sprint cars and go karts and everything else that goes with him and takes him when I'm not around Tommy Beavers and um, they're actually, their communication is way better than mine and Cole's. Is. So, um, you know, sometimes the father son dynamic don't always work, but they, they get along really well and they communicate really well when they're at the track. So it's, it's worked out um, very good in Cole's favor and helps alleviate me a little bit as far as having to worry about, you know, I want him to race as much as possible to learn as quick as possible and it's tough when I'm still racing. And final two questions. You mentioned just, uh, you know, just feel a little worn down in that area, like at times, but just you know, obviously when you do eventually hang up the helmet for the final time, just what do you feel you'll be most proud of in your career? Well, the thing I'm, I'm most proud about is I, I feel like I haven't changed with the success. Um, I'm the same person to me as I was when I started. Um, I try to help people out if they need help. Um, if somebody asks me a question, I tell them a truthful answer or I just don't answer the question. I don't I would not lie to them about it. I would just tell them I would, don't want to answer that. Um, and just, you know, treat people with respect and try to do all the right things in my career. And I, I feel like I've done that for the most part and, and, you know, feel like I've been you know accomplished about everything I've ever wanted to do. And um, right now I'm just enjoying it. I, 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 I really still enjoy racing. Um, so it, it's just, you know, as long as I'm still enjoying it and being competitive, we're going to keep doing it. That's the best attitude you can have. And final question, just, you know, obviously it's been a big shakeup in sprint car racing. We got high limit and that world of outlaws, just, you know, just having two national tours. I mean, it's been a huge debate. Just I mean, from your perspective, where do you kind of stand with it and kind of what's, when you see all this happening, what do you think? Um, I I have mixed feelings about it. Um, you know, when the high limit started, they 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 come out and said this is not to compete against the all the outlaws. It was a added races, you know, to for guys to you know race for more money, kind of like the late mall guys do. A year later, they're competing against the outlaws. Um, you know, it does. It helps and hurts racing. It split the field up from the outlaws. It does maybe give some guys some chance of racing, you know, for a little bit more money. But the flip side of that is they did away with a group that helped Ohio, Western PA, Indiana, Illinois racers as of the all-stars. Now, them guys are kind of left out in the cold. They they have nowhere to go race for decent money now, you know, and I, I just feel like they they maybe could have done it a little differently, but, you know, that, you know, Kyle and um, Brad and, you know, they're, they have their vision of what they want to do and, you know, that's their right to have that vision and, you know, how it plays out, we'll, we'll all have to wait and see. Um, the outlaws, you know, everybody – 
the outlaws are going nowhere. The outlaws have been around a long time. I've seen them go against, you know, other new organizations. Um, so, you know, I think down the road, you know, I mean, I guess we're just have to wait and see what happens because I just don't – some of the things the high limit does, I don't know if that's going to work down the road, what they're planning on, but who knows? I mean, it's early. It's only their first year. So, you know, they, they were very smart on hiring Mike Hess. Um, I think he's the best race director I've ever been around. And um, so I think they, that was a smart hire for them. And they got some other really good hires in place like Kendra Jacobs and um, other people that know the sport very well. So, um, you know, it's just a shame that, that they split up the competition from the outlaws. But, you know, that's part of business. And, you know, everybody, you know, I know the outlaws will survive. You know, I – I think high limit will probably survive too. I think they're, they have a, you know, this, they have smart people around them. So I think they'll be fine, you know, you know, but it's just a matter of how it all plays out down the road. But right now, you know, it's just a wait and see game. Yeah. It's interesting to see how everything plays out and there is that divide, but uh, who knows? It could be all fine and dandy in a year or two, but it was kind of, like you said, have to wait and see, but you know, Lance, I appreciate you taking the time. Uh, good luck this weekend. Uh, good luck the rest of the season. It's been great to talk with you, and uh, yeah, hope you have a really good day. All right. Thank you. Thanks for having me on, and um, you have a great day, too. Thanks for watching episode 57 with special guest Lance DeWeese. Now, one of the key things that stuck out with me with Lance's opinion on just the great sprint car debate of High Limit versus World of Outlaws. I mean, he was spot on was just the fact that just last year it was said that High Limit wasn't going to be a competitor to the Outlaws. Sure enough, one year later, they're directly competing with the Outlaws and just taking on this series nationally. Now, there's definitely a benefit of having both series, especially money-wise, but the thing that Lance pointed out that just sticks out to me the most is the effects this whole thing has had on the All-Star Circuit of Champions. Obviously, the All-Stars aren't a thing anymore. And without the staple of having that All-Stars just run in the Pennsylvania, Ohio region, it did leave a good bit of drivers out in the cold. But it will definitely be interesting to see just how this new dynamic plays out and what we may see just in terms of changes within sprint car racing in the coming years ahead. Well, that's all the time we have for today's show. Make sure to like, subscribe, and comment below what you thought of today's show. We appreciate your feedback and just excitement for racing, so fire away in the comments below. And make sure to follow this podcast on X and Instagram at Behind Catch. We appreciate your feedback there as well. So thanks for tuning in. Have a great rest of your day, and I'll catch you guys later.